Well, I am really delighted to have Susan Murcott here because I think as uh, you've already attested, um, her reputation precedes her. She's somebody who is both um, a scholar, but also has a real belief in translating that science into the real world, and has really, I think, made her life dedicated to trying to provide clean water to people, and uh, is a senior lecturer at MIT, and also the founder of a nonprofit that's been working in Ghana and trying to actually provide a scalable solution to actually get clean water to people. And so she's going to be reflecting on those experiences with us. And we're really delighted to have you here. Because as a center that focuses on the human right to water and sanitation, uh, those are just words unless we really have a way of getting that to people. Right, right, right. Um, yep. So thank you. That's really a nice introduction. And I'm, great. I'm grateful to be here and, and happy to share my work, uh, our work. Uh, so, I understand that the, the format is very informal, and I welcome uh, interruptions and um, uh, people to speak up from the outset. Otherwise, I'll just run with what I've got, uh, which I don't need to get to the back, to the, you know, to the bottom end of. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I made it easy on myself in uh, preparing today's presentation because I'm not talking about 25 <laughs> different things. I'm only talking about one thing. And that's the work that I've been doing for the last seven years. This is just the, the beginning of the eighth year um, in uh, attempting to bring safe water to northern Ghana uh, through this organization I helped to found, Cure Home Water. And I wanted to start with a very brief history of sanitary engineering at MIT and Harvard, mm -hmm. um, because we have some things in common. And <laughs> it starts with Ellen Swallow Richards, who was MIT's first woman graduate. And um, this is a little dense, but she graduated in chemistry from Vassar in 1870. So this was pretty early in the whole um, uh, period of, of women being able to attain uh, university education. She was the first uh, woman to receive a bachelor's degree, or any degree, from MIT, and she was the 58th graduate of MIT. Um, after her graduation, she was one of the first resident graduates, which was basically um, a graduate student. Um, but she wasn't given a, an advanced degree for her work because master's degrees uh, didn't exist then and PhDs didn't exist until much later. She ultimately, at the end of her life, and in fact you can see from this picture, um, has on the robes of a PhD. She was given an honorary degree um, in, late in life uh, from Smith. Uh, she was an instructor in sanitary chemistry uh, for almost three decades and um, in uh, in a, over a two-year period from 80, 1887 to 1889, she analyzed more than 40,000 40, water and wastewater samples. Um, this would have been, no doubt, um, her, her you know, full-time work for two years, um, which enabled the creation of the first ever water quality map. Um, so uh, I, I, um, I love this piece of her history because uh, my students and I do a lot of water quality testing. And um, uh, I'm not sure that I've done 40,000 analyses yet in my, in my whole career. So it's first ever <laughs> anywhere? Anywhere, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's an interesting story about that map, and that is that I went to MIT archives, assuming that they would have a copy of it because they have her papers. And um, they didn't. Um, the, 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 the map, which I had seen in old photos, um, because it's, it's hanging up in one of these 19th century photos of her lab. Um, is at the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts archives. So that sole copy was there, and they allowed me to borrow it, make a copy for MIT archives and, and for myself. And so now I have one hanging in my office as well. Mm -hmm. So now there are three, <laughs> the original and two copies. And um, she taught sanitary engineering um, starting in 1890, which was the first course of its type. I mean, the term sanitary engineering has sort of morphed into en environmental engineering, but it was really the beginning of, 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 of this um, 
of this type of course at any university in the world. She taught chemistry, bacteriology, engineering, and she educated the men primarily who went on to design and operate the world's first uh, municipal sanitation, water and sanitation facilities, research stations, and to set up um, health, public health and sanitary engineering departments. Uh, so she really was a pioneer. Another part of her story that I really like is that she brought the word ecology into the English language. Uh, it was being used in Germany, um, but her, uh, her philosophy was um, that one needed to be working both on the small scale and on the large scale. Um, the word ecology means, uh, in Greek, study of the house. Um, oikos is the word for house in Greek. And so um, study of the home. And um, for her, earth was our, is, of course, our home, but also the home itself, so that you needed both of those levels. And um, she was the teacher of some of the leading lights who founded uh, the uh, who, who, are, who are the ones who get credit for funding of the sort of sanitary uh, engineering movement, a guy named Thomas Drown, who, um, who became president of Lehigh after he left MIT, um, but who was credited with the, the work of the Mass Sanitary Survey. Um, uh, uh, basically, uh, his name was on the report for the analyses that she had done. Um, Hiram Whit Mills was the Boston politician who was known as the father of modern sanitation. Um, Hassan uh, ran the Lawrence Livermore Experimental Station, and um, he was recommended for that job. Um, she, he was his uh, Alan Swallow Richards student, and he was recommended for that job by her. A guy named Edwin Jordan, who was credited with the first work on gentrification, but in fact, um, that paper was jointly authored by Jordan and Swallow. And then um, the Harvard connection is with William Sedgwick, and he um, was, was considered the father of public health, and of the discipline of environmental engineering. And yet, um, at her um, memorial service, um, he eulogized her as his great teacher. And so, a little bit about Sedgwick. Um, he uh, went to Yale and then Johns Hopkins for his PhD. He taught at MIT for, um, uh, for almost four decades, and eventually went on to um, head the department. Um, he was curator of something called the Lowell Institute, which has actually got a really interesting history in itself, but uh, um, WGBH uh, radio can sort of trace its line lineage to the idea of, of public lectures and, and, um, and um, bringing sort of science and um, information to the public. So that's sort of where the origin of the Lowell Institute comes from. And um, he founded, he, um, William Sedgwick founded the Harvard School of Public Health, which actually started as a collaboration between Harvard and MIT um, through something called the Harvard MIT School of Health Officers. And that was the first professional training program in public health in the United States, begun back in 1913. You can see um, 1922, he founded, it says he said, that's when he founded the School of Public Health, and if you go onto the School of Public Health webpage, that's when they say they're in fact founded, but he died in 21, so I don't know that he, that he didn't found it earlier, or was part of it um, <laughs> earlier. Now, I call this a very brief history of, of um, sanitary engineering uh, because I fast forward to my mentor and professor, Donald Harleman, in the middle here, um, who was at MIT for 50 years and who taught wastewater treatment um, to uh, generations of students, including um, this um, one to his, uh, to his right, which was me, and some other students. Um, and this is in um, a lab in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And, um, I worked with him for more than a decade on wastewater treatment, first in um, coastal urban areas in the United States, um, in the Boston Harbor cleanup in the 1980s, and in um, upgrading some wastewater treatment plants in Southern California, like the Orange County um, uh, Sanitation District and uh, Hyperion Plant in Los Angeles. But, um, I influenced him at the end of his career when he was an emeritus professor in realizing that the innovative work that we were doing in low-cost wastewater treatment uh, was best applied in megacities in the developing world, so that he and I together, basically from the point he became emeritus professor in 1992 through the 90s, he and I worked together where we used his contacts around the world to set up experiments and at a bench scale 
at a pilot scale, like maybe in tanks the size of this room, or city scale, like I, I ran an experiment with the city of Budapest's wastewater, which was the entire city, um, and um, it was to demonstrate uh, the innovation in wastewater treatment that he and I worked on for many years. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, that's a whole, I could give a whole lecture on that, but if you're interested in wastewater, we can, we can uh, segue into that later. Uh, I always wanted to do water and wastewater work in the developing world. And uh, in my early career, I, I, there, there, weren't there was a lot of opportunities to do big city wastewater, but not opportunities to do drinking water. It just, projects weren't coming my way. Um, but I went through a turning point in, 19, um, in 1997 and 1998 where I had my first two opportunities to do consulting projects, well, in Myanmar, a consulting project in, in Nepal, this Women in Water Conference that really um, sort of redirected my uh, focus on my career. Um, in Myanmar, uh, I was invited by some medical doctors from Boston who were um, working in a clinic in, uh, in a rural area in northern Burma. Um, they were actually um, quietly affiliated with Aung San Suu Kyi, the uh, human rights um, um, activist and Nobel Peace Laureate. Um, and uh, the project that the doctors were doing was that they were bringing uh, computers and software to this clinic so that they could keep better medical records. So what a, a typical um, developing world clinics medical record would look like would be maybe a couple of columns like the date, the person's name, and the medicine that's dispensed. Um, and by setting up these computers and the software they had um, created for the patients in the hospital a much more complete um, diagnostic record of um, the illnesses and were surprised to find that about three quarters of the people had waterborne diseases. That's actually not so shocking, all right? But um, it was shocking to them because they had to rethink what they were doing. Was it really that they should be bringing computers, right? Um, uh, and software, or should they be bringing, and, or should they be bringing, dying, you know, like oral rehydration therapy medicines? Or maybe they should be bringing a water engineer who could sort of sort out, like, uh, what the water problems were. And so at that time, in the, this is 1997, you know, honestly, at, at engineering programs around the country, it was very rare that anybody was talking about um, familial development goals or water and sanitation and development or that people even knew that there were a billion people or more without safe water or adequate sanitation. So there was a certain disconnect, um, <laughs> uh, at least as I experienced it in my engineering education, between like what to me were the biggest water and sanitation problems in the world and the high-tech sort of focus of the engineering education, all right? And the part two of this transformation or revelation on my part was that I was invited by some women friends to this Women in Water Conference in 1998. And the background to this was that the uh, friends of mine who were from Berkeley, California, had been involved for a number of years in a uh, campaign to clean up the Ganges River in Benares, India, which is a major undertaking, a life, lifetimes of undertaking, because it's one of the most polluted rivers on the planet. And um, through those associations, and in fact, they were working with a, um, not a pastor, but a, a um, temple, mm, I forget his, He's a Hindu temple, mm, I forget uh, the proper title for, for him, but he was also an engineer, okay? Um, Mahanchi is his name, um, and he was a professor at Benares Hindu University, and he was actually the hereditary priest of this temple on the banks of the Ganges um, that, that traced back through his, his lineage for till the 14th century or something. I mean, so he was definitely, mm -hmm in both worlds. And uh, the folks from uh, the Spinaris community uh, and my friends from Berkeley attended the United Nations Women's Conference 
in Beijing in 1995 and did a series of workshops on women in water and the role that women play around the world in water and in carrying water, in caring for children who are sick from waterborne diseases. And they got excited about having a series of conferences on women in water, which, which actually have taken place and continue to take place from time to time over these, uh, this last decade. So the first uh, conference after Beijing was in Benares um, at this temple. And um, there were about 50 participants, of which maybe 40 were from India, and a couple were from Berkeley, and a few handful were from around the world. And when they looked around the table at who was there, they realized they had a lot of different skills. You know, that maybe environmental planning, and you know, ministry and health, and you know, law. And, but they didn't have a single male or female engineer in the room and that if they were going to be talking about water and development that they really need to look around and find one. <laughs> so they looked around and they found me and at that stage in my career, actually in this stage as represented by this picture, I had been doing megacities wastewater for close to a decade. So <laughs> and here I was being brought to this conference in Nepal where Nepal as a population, very similar uh, it's to size in Ghana, it's about 25 million people. Um, it's about the same uh, geographic size as Ghana. And uh, I would say it, uh, it's about 85 or 90 percent of the people earn their living through uh, agriculture, okay, peasant farmers. And uh, 75 percent of women are illiterate or were a decade ago in Nepal. Um, and the organizers of this conference, who were educated Nepali women, brought a representative selection of Nepali women to the conference, right? So I was totally flabbergasted because I had been to various professional and other conferences in my life, but I had never been and wasn't expecting to be at a conference where most of the participants were illiterate. And there were women who came to this conference walking for one or two or three days, right? by foot, by foot, <laughs> um, because they had water problems in their villages, and they had heard that this expert was coming. <laughs> and I knew how to design innovations for wastewater for Mexico City, 20 million people, right? <laughs> and these are rural women, right? And so, so I mean, because engineers, water engineers, sanitary engineers from this you know, noble tradition that we represent here at Harvard and MIT and Brandeis and elsewhere, um, have been successful in providing safe water and sanitation to a fair degree that we have come to take for granted through centralized systems, right? And so that's what, so that's sort of the default thing that we get trained to do is to build centralized systems. And the disconnect for me was like, on the one hand, whoa, there's a billion people in the world who don't have safe water, and nobody has ever come and given a lecture at MIT on that subject at that stage, right? I mean, now it's very popular, right? But then, it was not so long ago, there was like not, not, there wasn't much awareness about that. So, uh, so, so this was sort of a wake-up moment for me, and I learned about the need for safe and accessible water from women like these, and I realized that, uh, and basically I said to these women, when they came to me and said, my children are sick and dying, what is the solution to my rural drinking water problem? And I had to say, I don't know, all right? And so it was shocking to me that I had been in this elite world of engineering for quite a long time, but that I did not, and that I knew basically the processes to provide solutions are appropriate at, at whatever scale, it's just that they hadn't been applied to a small scale, right? And that that scale needed to be uh, either community scale or household scale. In other words, centralized solutions would not in our lifetimes be affordable uh, for these people, all right? And, um, and so that's, 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 that's where um, I, as I say, I kind of went through this kind of wake up. Um, because, just to give an example that's close to heart, um, 
we in Boston are the beneficiaries these days of the Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. And does anyone care to guess what that cost? Six billion? It's four. So that's, yeah. And the water upgrade that we had um, for the for the Boston's MWRA and Massachusetts Water Resources Authority's water system, that was a billion dollars. Both of these um, price tags sort of came in in the 80s, 90s, all right? And, um, and the service population is two and a half million people. So we've got five billion dollars for two and a half million people, and that's what's giving us our water and wastewater treatment. And you know the average income for these folks in Nepal is a dollar a day, um, and so it's just it just doesn't add up, right? And so the challenge to me was how do we as engineers rethink solutions to, re to take the um, the water and wastewater treatment processes and apply it to these um, smaller scales in ways that are um, simple and and affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. That's been my life work since. All right, and um, yeah, so the context you all well know from this water study group is that we live in a world of water rich and the water poor, and the sanitation rich and the sanitation poor. And since those experiences in Myanmar and actually everything leading up to Myanmar and, and, and Nepal, um, I came back from those experiences with the decision that I wanted to devote my career to a focus on small-scale solutions. All right. So since 1998, um, I um, have been leading teams of students within the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department's Masters of Engineering program, uh, as well as teaching courses at MIT. Basically, that's my day job. Um, and um, we've worked in a number of countries. Um, but we've, we've worked in a number of countries in order to learn things. And for um, I, I think of my work as having two components. One is uh, to be to, to mentor and teach students. Um, but the second and most important part is that what we learn is applied um, and does good for some people. All right? You can't do good maybe everywhere to all the different opportunities we've had to travel the world, but we have tried, especially in two countries, to kind of make um, a kind of long-term commitment. And the first country that I committed to and thought I'd be in working in for the rest of my life was Nepal, because that's where I sort of I had made the commitment to those women at the conference that I would come back and that I would work with them on, um, um, on solutions, um, drinking water treatment solutions. Um, Ah, I wanted to say that the teams um, that I've led include also um, uh, those from other universities, um, and I want to particularly highlight today Mark's contribution. So um, I'm not sure if all of you know him or only some of you, um, but um, he would be here in this room uh, if he were not in Ghana working with Pure Home Water, the organization I helped to found. He, he with Sharmila, have helped to set up um, my being here today. and. Um, he is a lawyer, like Chanel, and um, is um, a fellow uh, in this in this sustainability program, or is it uh, Carson Human Rights? Program. The human rights, the human. Uh, I even have it there. Human rights and water <laughs> and sanitation. Program. All right, and this is um, his first week in Ghana. Um, uh, we sent him off to a village to uh, figure out some of the challenges we were having in that village. My work. Uh, has a website associated with it and a kind of framework which I call Safe Water for a Billion People. And um, you're welcome to visit that site. I think you all know these basic stats. You've covered this already, so I'm not going to belabor that there are um, somewhat less than a billion now, but about 800 million people lack improved water supply. And um, those red um, rows represent um, the water sources that people who are using so-called unimproved water are drinking, surface water and unprotected dug wells and unprotected springs or tanker or truck or vented water. That represents about 11% of the global population. Um, but recent work um, by um, 
Arna and others, um, Jamie Bartram, and a number of authors estimate that there is an additional 1.2 billion um, who are people facing serious sanitary risks. And I think you can imagine what that would be like when you go to Mexico City or Delhi, um, you don't necessarily drink the water from the tap in those cities, even though it's tap water. So it's technically considered improved water, um, but it's not safe water, right? And um, so a kind of higher standard um, to improve to the UN definitions of improved versus unimproved water or sanitation is um, safe. And on the sanitation side, um, there's about 2.5 billion people who lack um, adequate sanitation. And um, this is not exactly um, the, the same um, map, but you can see that um, large parts of Asia um, are not on track um, to meet um, the Millennial Development Goal for basic sanitation in large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and a few countries in um, Latin America. So, um, in fact, I mentioned that I wanted to make a long-term commitment but for our work to do good somewhere, and I thought it would be Nepal. And after seven years of work in Nepal, and whole long stories and lectures I can give on what we were able to accomplish in Nepal um, and what still needs to be done in Nepal, we couldn't continue to work there because of civil unrest. I can't take students, and I don't want to take students um, um, to countries where it's unstable. Um, and it's, um, it, it was because of those circumstances that I found myself in Ghana um, um, quite unexpectedly because I had never, starting in 2005, been in Africa in my life even though I had spent a great deal of time in Asia and some fair amount of time in Latin America. Um, but Africa was completely new to me. And um, you can see, yeah, go ahead. A quick question, like yeah. just purely from a data perspective. Um, Argentina and Italy, insufficient data or not? I'm just like interested um, yeah, it's about the... Argentina and Italy. Um, as to the, you why? can kind of understand for, um, for Western Sahara, uh, that there would be insufficient data, maybe. Mm -hmm. But you know, Argentina and India. Right. Is quite I think the reason they say not applicable, at least for Italy, is that I have the idea, as you can see, there's a few other kind of great countries mm -hmm. in um, Europe, is that it's been 100% for so long that they're, they're I, they must be keeping data, but it's just like it's not like being registered. I okay. think that that's why for Italy. But um, Argentina wouldn't be in that category. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer for you. You can look at the JMP, the Joint yeah. Monitoring the Yeah, website. yeah, and it yeah. Just, I just, it just jumped out at me. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I was looking at that on this one because um, because I actually, um, the numbers, uh, when I cut and paste this particular graph, the numbers um, here weren't coming out clearly, so I, I retyped I retype them um, so that we could see that um, this is the percentage of deaths attributable to wash diseases. Um, and um, uh, the red countries are greater than 15% 15, 15 of deaths are attributable to water uh, sanitation hygiene diseases. All right, and so um, if one is a water and sanitation engineer um, and one wants to have a big impact, then these red countries are the ones um, where one could potentially, th this would be where one could potentially do the most good. And is that fine? Are we children? With children under five, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this um, was just an interesting thing when I googled today. Um, it's uh, I'm not sure how reliable <laughs> the, the data is. I've given you the URL, but um, um, it, in terms of uh, world life expectancy, um, Ghana is number two lowest ranked in the world for diarrhea. All right, uh, and just by contrast, um, and not the best, because this is out of a scale of uh, 194 countries, I believe. Um, the United States is um, number 133, and it has 1.2, oops, I can't copy that wrong, 1.2 deaths per 1,000 live births. Um, 
even though I don't know that this is the most reliable, they, they don't even tell us where they get their data from <laughs> for this, so I'm a little suspicious, but I know that this number is pretty accurate, all right? And, I've been, and, and, and I knew that Ghana was doing a pretty poor job um, at addressing diarrheal disease in children. And I can tell you why. Okay, now this, so this is our own, this is, this is um, the demographic and health survey data here. And this is um, a survey data that we've done this year for certain villages in our area that we're working in. And so in Ghana, which is about the size of the state of New York, um, the, the, this, this is a little bit different because this is mortality and this is um, children with diarrhea under five. But um, Pier Home Water, which I'll tell you about in the second part of this lecture, has focused on the northern part of Ghana. It's called the northern sector. It's three regions, the northern region, the upper west, and the upper east. And those are like states to us in the United States. And uh, northern region had 32.5% of children under five with diarrhea. That's huge. That's really huge. Um, at the time of the survey. In other words, the, the survey question for the DHS asks uh, the, the caretaker, um, has your child had uh, diarrhea within the last two weeks? And so 32% uh, uh, of kids um, have had diarrhea within the last two weeks in this district. And um, the second worst is Brangahafa, 28%, right? And then in the villages that we were surveying uh, in our sort of service area, um, you can see that the numbers are somewhat similar. I mean, on average, across all the villages, we were getting 23%. We were asking the question a little differently because we were asking uh, for 48-hour recall. Um, but y we certainly were getting high numbers, 33 36 37% as well for certain villages. Um, so that's the situation of diarrheal disease with children. And to just focus in on um, northern region, uh, kind of our home state, as it were, or our home region. We're based in Tamale, which is the regional capital. Each, each uh, region has its you know, uh, regional capital. And um, what this chart, this map shows, is um, the, this circle represents the, the blue is, is the uh, improved water sources, and the brown is the unimproved. So in the regional capital, about three quarters of the people in that uh, district uh, have a household connection or a, a borehole or a public standpipe because it has a municipal water treatment plant, a centralized water treatment plant, because it's the, the regional capital. But when you go out into the outlying areas, by and large, you're seeing about three quarters of the people have unimproved water, and that means surface water sources, unprotected springs and dug wells, tanker truck water, vended water. And what that looks like is this. This is a typical surface water source. This is not, you know, extreme. It's extreme to us, but it's not extreme to, um, to what is typical there. And in fact, um, if you look on Google Maps, um, this, is, um, this is that source. This is our factory. And this is our neighboring village right, called Taha. Um, and um, we are, this is the road to town, and we are five miles from the center of town. So, <laughs> so even though, so we're, we're obviously part of this unimproved water, but we're only five miles out of the center of town. And so you can well imagine that when you get out into um, more remote areas um, that um, there's a lot more unimproved water. The other thing that is, um, graphically illustrative of the circumstances of this town, this village, is that these are the schools right here. And, um, and the, we have workers from um, this village that are working in our factory now. There are, 200, there are about 500 people in the village. There are about 280 kids in these schools. And there's, there, there are five latrines, uh, pit latrines, in the village for 500 people, and there's no latrines for the schools, all right? So that means that most people uh, practice open defecation right in here. In fact, when we first built the factory, we were going behind these trees ourselves, um, or just going to the bathroom at home before you get out to the factory. Um, 
And um, the rather poignant thing is that once we built, um, so this is our land, it's two acres, and once we built our latrine, our, we built an ecological latrine in this corner of the factory, the kids from the school all kind of come and defecate around here. <laughs> <laughs> all 280 of them, <laughs> because they have an idea that like that's something you know to do with using a toilet. <laughs> but the factory manager, and I don't control this, um, keeps it locked just for the factory workers. Um, we will. Uh, it's high on my list of to do when we can raise some money for latrines, um, build a block of latrines, hopefully in the next year for the school, and then keep going down the road here to the next village. There's a, another school with 180 kids, and um, they are the village that provides the clay for our factory. So we need to, we need and want to do something for them. But this is just illustrative, because we could just keep going down that road to the next village, and the next school, and the next village, and the next school, and I can guarantee you most of those villages and people are practicing open defecation. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's just our factory. These are the kids. Uh, we, had a, we had a workshop in January um, with these kids to find out from them what they'd learned about water and sanitation, about hand washing. Um, of course, if they, don't have, they don't have any uh, water. The, the water is, is that, that source that I showed you. They don't, but they don't have like a hand washing station at the school. So what we decided to do was to have a uh, field trip to go visit their toilets and then to come and visit our toilet. <laughs> this is the kids on the field trip. And also a kind of design charrette to have them give input as to what kind of, uh, you know, what did they think about the different designs of the toilets that they were seeing and what did they like and what did they want. And uh, so we had quite a lot of fun with that um, on a day in January. So now um, Ghana, just as it's, um, has um, unacceptably high rates of diarrheal disease um, and um, high rates of children under five um, dying from wash-related illnesses. It has, um, and, and though Ghana has many, Ghana is not the lowest of the low um, in, in terms of, um, it, it's, 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 it's got a democratic government, it's got a great soccer team, it's got um, a growing economy, um, it's, um, it's, it, it shouldn't be this bad, um, but it has. Been, it was the fourth lowest rate of sanitation coverage in the world in 2008, and has only 14% improved sanitation coverage in 2010. So that's really, really low. And um, 15 countries are in a category that have more than 25% of their population using shared sanitation, and Ghana has almost 60% of people using shared sanitation. So. There's, for, for a sanitary engineer like myself, there is, there's lifetimes of work to do in Ghana. And um, so um, that's what's kept me there for these seven years. Um, and who knows, um, I may be here for very much longer. So with that, that's sort of a natural sort of midpoint to my talk. Um, are there any kind of reflections or thoughts or questions? that you may get, might get into later, but um, I've done projects with Water for People and Engineers Without Borders, and, I, and, and Susan did Water for People. So I think one of the principles of Water for People is to not have a household connection, at least have it in the yard or possibly on the street. The idea that you don't want to encourage a lot of water use in the mm. family mm. can then create sanitation problems. As so we did in the 19th century in this country. Yeah. So Is that your experience? As yeah, well? yeah. Well, um, I, I didn't, I mean, I've been a member of Water for People since it mm. was founded, and I, but I don't follow, you know, its right. philosophy closely, so I hadn't heard that piece before. Um, but it, 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 it makes a lot of sense mm. to me because um, because y you need both sides. If you're going to bring in a large quantity of water, you need some way of, 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 um, of discharging it or recycling it. Um, and if you don't have a kind of the water and sanitation sort of system in place, 
then you can create problems. The leading cause of death for children in Ghana um, and lots, large parts of, of, of Africa is uh, malaria. And so if you have a lot of standing water around, you're going to create breeding grounds uh, for malaria. Diarrheal disease is number two, all right? So, um, so that's the thinking, I think, um, is that you need to figure out a way of discharging that water or recycling that water. And at the scale that you're probably you're going to talk about with pure home water, do you find that an issue? No, because we're, we're, we're really, you know, we've been trying to increase the quantity of water that the filters produce. Um, we've been at the other end. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me show you this little three-minute YouTube video. Unless, Susan, did you have anything? No. Anybody else? That Pure Home Water is a social enterprise founded in 2005 for the reasons I said that I had been working from 1998 up till 2005 in Nepal and hit a wall, couldn't keep working there, and happened to have um, the good fortune to get two years of funding um, to work uh, demonstrating household drinking water treatment and safe storage in Ghana. And um, as I say, Africa was new to me, Ghana was new to me. I had been told that the northern half of the country, I, had, I didn't have much data, but the northern half of the country was the poorest part of Ghana and most in need of safe water. And so I just sort of looked at the map and picked Tambale, and that's where we sort of based ourselves for those two years. And it's been, um, it's been a good base of operations. Um, our goals are to reach people most in need with water sanitation and hygiene, especially in the northern part, and to become financially and locally self-sustaining. And that sounds, you know, pretty simple, <laughs> but it not, hasn't been simple. Um, and we have one product, which we've actually rebranded. Ah, I put in the old put in the old, uh, so we used to call it the Kosum filter. There's over 70 local languages in Ghana. Clement can tell you much more about Ghanaian culture. Um, do you want to segue and say anything about Ghanaian culture? Uh, yes, okay. you know, there's so many tribes and so many languages. I think Negroes, so all, so every sometimes. Um, but um, um, mostly the um, Chi, which is a um, uh, a language spoken by an uh, ethnic group known as the Akans is mostly is widely spoken by everybody. So uh, that is used as the lingua franca for most people, apart from English. So you use the Chi language. When you go to the northern, uh, northern sector, there are so many ethnic groups. But um, these ethnic groups kind of have um, words which are similar. If you speak one, you can easily understand what the other person is saying. But they are very diverse their way of culture, and the way they eat, the food they eat, and then um, the way they dress. Um, you can travel, let's say, um, 10 kilo, let's say 10 kilometers or 10 miles, and you have a different ethnic group. You do not speak the language of other people. So it's really a very small country with so many diverse people. Right, exactly, exactly. So think, uh, you know, it's a country the size of New York, speaking 70 different languages. And um, the, the largest ethnic group in our neighborhood of Tamale is called the, the Gomba people. And they speak a language called Dagbani. And we thought, oh, well, we'll name the product after, in their language. Um, which, and so we called Kosin Filter for the first five years, which in Dagbani means uh, pure water. All right. but, then uh, there's lots of other ethnic <laughs> groups around us as we go to the Upper East, to the Upper West, and even just outside of Tamala. And so it was for that reason that, because English is the official language, that we chose um, a product brand name that was English. So now let's just see if how we're doing here and how I, uh, how I, how I find that. Do I hit it again? No, 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 no. What do I do? Just go back to the Firefox. Um, oh, to the Firefox down here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay no. Oh, but we're better. not, we, we still got like miles to go, right? Yeah. Okay. At least so, it's working. Yeah, and this is working. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you know, I, I may be giving more of a build up to this <laughs> little YouTube video than it's worth, but I'm, it's, it's my baby. I'm kind of proud of it. So, all right. So we've got the, we've got Pure Home Water and we've got the product. And the background to this is kind of interesting. So. 
the filter was invented by a guy named Fernando Mazariegas, who's a Guatemalan, a very sweet and humble scientist, who worked with artisans, such as you see in this poster, um, to develop the filter, but did little to disseminate it, all right? Um, and the kind of disseminators uh, were uh, these two guys, uh, especially, but others, but Ron Rivera and Manny Hernandez. Uh, Manny um, has just arrived at our factory yesterday um, and has been there seven times in the last two years. So uh, without Manny, we would not have a factory. And Ron was like a brother to me um, after I met him in about 2001. And his life work after he kind of got religion on this filter, after he learned about it from Fernando Mazariegos, was um, that he wanted to seed the construction of 100 factories in his lifetime. And he basically, for a plane ticket and, a, and you know, room and board, would go anywhere in the world to work with uh, potters or ceramicists to help them if they had already, say, a ceramics wares business or a brick making business to teach them how to make these filters. Can I, can yeah, I ask you a question about the prior slide where you said he invented the ceramic filter? Because mm -hmm. my understanding was it's actually an ancient technology, technology mm -hmm. and that what yeah, was yeah, new yeah, was yeah. really perhaps making it better. Well, it's interesting that it would come out of Latin America because um, there are filters from Latin America that come by way of the Spaniards and even uh, the Mayans and, um, um, and, and in Peru um, that I have a picture, not in this slideshow, of a uh, pumice filter mm -hmm. uh, from volcanic rock um, that was from a 17th century um, um, nunnery, um, but it was a, a porous filter. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a filter in my office that Ron gave me from Cuba that's 100 years old that is a, a disc filter. In other words, it's a two-compartment system where you put the water in the top and it drips down through this disc um, into the filter below. And I've actually had a friend um, who, in visiting Cuba, went to find the site of this old 100-year-old um, factory that was producing these filters in Cuba. Um, and so there is definitely a tradition of filter use, um, especially coming from the Spaniards and a little bit indigenous in Latin America. Um, what, what Fernando Mazariegos invented was a, the concept of a pot filter um, that was uh, coated with a, a colloidal silver. Um, so it was a, um, yeah, so that, that, was the, that was his idea, all right? And, um, Ron and Manny and others have been disseminators of this of this product. And and why, from a from a engineering standpoint, what's unique about collo colloidal? Oh oh, mm -hmm. I see. Um, so 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 the um, the filter is effective at sieving out and um, absorbing um, bacteria and protozoa. All right, let's just back up. Um, water can be contaminated, broadly speaking, in four ways. Um, it could be microbiologically contaminated, chemically contaminated, physically contaminated, or radiologically contaminated. All right. So Fukushima Daiichi's nuclear accident is creating radiological contamination, um, and the microbiological contamination is the largest source of contamination worldwide. It's human or animal feces getting into drinking water that's causing diarrheal diseases in children, um, especially in children and in vulnerable populations. Um, and microbiological uh, contaminants uh, have four categories. They can be bacteria, viruses, protozoa, like Cryptosporidium or Giardia. We worry about that in uh, first world countries. And worms, all right? And so, this filter can um, take out bacteriological contamination and protozoa, but not, um, not the viruses because they're too tiny, all right? And worms tend to be transmitted by um, soil or food um, and not so much by water. Okay, there's, there are some, guinea worm uh, especially, is 
transmitted by drinking water, but that is an, an, an unusual word. Okay. Um, oh, and physical and chemical. So chemical is a whole universe of, of possibilities, um, like pesticides or PCBs or whatever. Um, and uh, physical would be, for example, uh, particles in the water or taste or smell. Um, uh, so it's, um, it's often associated with the aesthetic characteristics of the water, but not with the health characteristics of the water. All right? And so um, this filter can take out uh, physical turbidity, like uh, the particles in the water, mm -hmm. and it can take out bacteria and protozoa. So, and the, so and to get to your question, what does the uh, colloidal silver do? It, it, it has, a colloidal silver has a biocidal property, mm -hmm. properties. Mm -hmm. So it helps to um, disinfect the water, kill the bacteria. Sorry, is this no, 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 sorry, no, no, that's um, what I like to have. Yeah, about like this, this um, particular, well, well this northern, uh, northern region of Ghana, um, I'm just trying to understand, I don't know what the water basins look like and sort of where the sources of the water are coming mm -hmm. through, what the possible like reasons for actually having. All right, so the surface waters that you saw mm -hmm. in that picture um, are actually uh, rainwater harvesting devices uh, or, or structures, all right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Ghana has um, a nine-month dry season and a three-month rainy season. And when it rains, it pours. All right. So it's a really, they don't call it monsoon, but it's sort of like torrential. Yeah. Right? In fact, an easy way to imagine that is that we all live in Boston. It's been raining a lot lately. <laughs> right? And um, the amount of rainfall in northern Ghana is about equivalent to the amount of rainfall in Boston, except it all comes in three months. So if you can imagine taking all of our rainfall and putting it in three months, that's how you, that's that's what it's like in Ghana. And then it's like and then it's dry like like New Mexico or Arizona, like the American Southwest. It's like desert for the rest of the time. All right, or they actually it's technically savanna. All right, grasslands, not desert, but it's desert-like to to us. Right, and um, so tell me your question again. And I'll oh, yeah, the basins. So yeah. then the basins are. Were, were, were conceived of as um, places to harvest the rainwater. And because there's a lot of clay in the soil in northern Ghana, um, that acts as sort of like a, a, a layer that holds the water. Um, and um, then it either evaporates or it doesn't. So, so these are like man-made sort man -made, of harvesting. Yeah, They're not yeah, near sort of yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And there's actually, actually two ways you can make it. You can either just sort of dig. Call, they call them dugouts. All right, and that's what they, you, yeah. you can go in there with a bulldozer and just dig it out, and then like, like a donut around the perimeter is, is like um, you know, a, a wall to kind of keep the water in. Or the other thing you can do, they also call them dams, is that you might have intermittent streams um, that are running in the rainy season, and then you can put a dam, um, in other words, build that uh, wall up on one side to capture the water um, that's, um, that's there so that you have a place both for collecting water um, near to your village site. Mm -hmm. You could see from the picture that I showed you, um, and that's what I, I love about, one of the many things one that we all love about Google Earth, is, um, is you, can, you, can, you can really see the, um, you can, this, is, this is the path that the women walk mm -hmm. to the water source. And it's not so far. I mean, it's maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but they do it a few times a day. Um, and of course, the kids too, you know, go to get their water there. And, um, and uh, so, so that's their route. Go ahead. No, I'm just trying to work out the, my right, inner geographer. Geographer is trying to work out what the different structures are. Um, but sort of how long have these, these um, structures been around? Yeah. I've heard, like, that they, Ghana was the first country to have the Peace Corps um, mm -hmm. in like 1963, mm -hmm. I think, or 62, when Kennedy kind of set that in motion. And um, I think it goes back to that era. Um, there's also been uh, various European aid groups, and so I've heard that there's some church, I forget, like the Dutch Reformed Church, or somebody who was the first to start these, and maybe the Peace Corps. I'm really not sure, but they definitely predate. You know, they go back yeah, a sort of ways. About independence but they don't go years. back. They don't go back hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so then, okay. So and they're kind of unique to the north. You won't find okay. these in the south. Then you have rivers. 
All right, um, streams and rivers. And um, the Volta River is a huge river um, that runs through the whole country, uh, including through northern Ghana. I don't know that I have, um, that my map even shows the rivers at all. No, yeah, because you get more arid the further north you get. That's it, right. exactly yeah. right. Well, the coast is, is was historically rainforest. Yeah, yeah. it's not. And, um, but it's, oh, it's really all agricultural. I mean, a lot of the rainforest has is, is, is been destroyed. And then the north is savanna, um, which is grasslands. And, and like parts of South Africa, you know, there's like trees. There's lots of trees, really, but that they're more spread out. Yeah. yeah. Of course, not as cold as, as South Africa gets. And parts of, parts of, parts of, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. The dams uh, actually started in the uh, early 80s. The dams. The, yeah, the dams. In the 80s. Yeah, in the 80s, when the um, World Bank um, uh, wanted to improve irrigation uh, farming. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, predating that, um, most people had it at, uh, like you said, rivers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they had these springs. <laughs> That's where they used to get water from. But the dams, um, dams serve two purposes for drinking water source. Uh, for the animals and uh, livestock, and uh, for uh, what I call it, vegetable uh, uh, farming. That's when they started building dams like that. The international, um, uh, what I call it, IFA, I don't know, mm -hmm. International Food and Agriculture, um, or like, uh, whatever, Af uh, whatever, International Food and Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Oh, the FAO. FAO, they, yes. are, they, uh, they started um, building those um, uh, dams. Uh, and even till today, they still go and they support a municipal project to go dams in villages mm -hmm. so that they can use those dams for farming and drinking water sources. Ex exactly. And, um, and um, th it, there's kind of a trade off because obviously it's unimproved water supply, right? It's not safe drinking water, but it is water close to, closer than having to go long distances. Like you, maybe there's a borehole, but maybe it's two, two miles away. And so the women and children who have to do that walk have to do a trade-off between are they getting safe water or are they getting close to the home water. Can I ask a question too about even when you made this decision about um, deciding to invest in building a factory and mm -hmm. ceramic filters, was there some other intervention that could have oh, could have been done, but, absolutely. but at the scale of that might have been less household based at the community level. Right, in terms and so I have, and you should catchment. have come and give a, a talk in your, in your group um, to fabulous former students who've started a very successful competing NGO <laughs> called Community Water Solutions. And I'm really proud of them and what they've accomplished because they have targeted dugouts and they have a very interesting model. Did I have Kate come to a guest talk? Yeah. I did, yeah. all right. Um, so their model is that in a village like our Taha, um, which has its primary water source, a dugout, they work with the chief and the community to identify usually an um, older or middle-aged woman who is um, their primary treatment lady. And um, they um, build a mini water treatment plant, which is comprised of a poly tank and um, Locally, they know how to use alum, which is which they make into balls. And alum is a coagulant that causes the particles in the water to clump together into larger particles and settle out. All right. And so, when the water is really turbid, um, villagers do obtain in the marketplace um, this alum, and in a unique way. I've never seen it in any other country. Almost like they make meatballs. <laughs> they make um, they make these alum balls just by adding water and sort of scrunching it together. And actually then, with their hand, they use that like as a paddle to coagulate the water. And um, they do that typically on a household scale, historically, but with community water solutions, they have scaled up slightly and they're using 50 gallon drums. Um, and so the women would um, collect the water bring it to the 50 gallon drums at the treatment plant, which is usually right next to the dugout. And then they coagulate the water. Then they decant it from that into the bigger tank. So the 50 gallon drums then goes into a 150 gallon poly tank. And then into that 150 gallon tank, they have a big chlorine tablet that they pop in. So it's pretty simple because they know the coagulation and they know the disinfection. 
And if you have ever had the opportunity to see the Cambridge water treatment plant, you'll know that it's um, a very snazzy, state-of-the-art, new treatment plant uh, that was built in the last five or ten years. But um, in my day, when I was a graduate student, I got to work in the original, or the early Cambridge water treatment plant, which was coagulation filtration, all right? Which is exactly that basic treatment, okay? So Cambridge, up till ten years ago, was doing the same kind of treatment that Community Water Solutions is doing, all right? Um, which are the two most basic steps in treating drinking water. It's like a particle removal step. It's to take out that physical contamination, um, which you need to do because even though the physical contamination, like say there's leaves or gra grains of sand in the water, it's not going to cause a health problem, but uh, bacteria uh, and microbes attach to the particles. So your first step in a water treatment plant is to take out the particles, and, and that takes you some way toward disinfecting the water, but it doesn't take you the whole way. And then you need a disinfection step, and that's the chlorine. All right, that's what they were doing in Cambridge, that's what they were doing in Community Water Solutions. And so then, with Community Water Solutions, what they next do is um, they give to the community, to each household, a free safe storage container. And with that, and that's a bucket, a 10 liter bucket, with a lid, with a spigot, and if you're going to walk to the dugout with your uh, vessel, you can either bring your normal vessel, which is like a, a metal thing usually, or a wash basin, and get your uh, dirty water, or you can come to the treatment plant and bring your safe storage container and five cents to fill up um, your, um, your, your, your safe storage container. And that five cents goes to the treatment lady, and the treatment lady sets aside the first 30 cents to buy the next day's tablets and the alum balls, and then she pockets the rest of the money. So it's a small business for her. And they've, I think, got 50 community treatment plants now. And so, and so, so here's, here's the sort of, you know, background story. And that is that when I had my revelation, right, it was that I knew the solutions needed to be community scale or household scale but I didn't have any money to do any of this, right? I've been pretty uh, um, unsuccessful in raising money in the work that I do. And when I started on this path, I expected, I, I wasn't entirely, you know, I wasn't, I was expecting that it was going to be hard, right? Uh, because, because there wasn't a lot of awareness to start with of the importance of waterborne diseases and, and things that there is a whole lot more awareness of today. However, um, the um, way that I've been able to successfully manage a career in this field um, where there aren't a lot of jobs, there's lots of students who want to do this work, but there aren't a lot of jobs in this field that are just sort of, you know, begging to be done. Um, and I have been able to successfully kind of pay the rent through my teaching and um, do service projects, you know, through my work. And um, the nice thing about household treatment systems is that they make very bite-sized master's thesis projects. So that there's an infinite number. I mean, had I worked on community systems like uh, Kate and Vanessa and their community water solutions, you'd be doing sort of the same thing over and over and over again, and that's not so exciting for students. But I, I mean, there's, <laughs> there is no end to, to engineering um, and, um, and, and, and other policy challenges to the sort of path I've taken. Yeah. So and it's been a sort of... We, we probably, since we have about 15 minutes left, should probably let you get to get to the main, more get, of get the, the, yeah. the, the taste of her water, the taste of her water, does that... Yeah, it has a kind sure? of, uh, the taste of the water through the filter, is that what you're asking? It's through, was it Kate's? Oh, through was Kate's, yeah, Kate. so it has a chlorine taste, it does. and some people don't, uh, in Ghana, yeah, we've, we've done some work on that, and people actually associate that with um, luxury water. You know, the, the wealthy. But lots of other countries like Nepal, mm -mm, they don't like, they, they like pure mountain water. They don't want the chlorine taste. And so it really varies from culture to culture. Um, here I go again. I've been raving on and on and haven't even gotten to my main point. Let's see if we can play my video.
Um, if not, we would just back, save going it. back to Mozilla? Mozilla to go, we go. Yep. I'm a slow learner, but I get there. Ah, I can't believe that. That's as far as it's gotten? All right, so those of you who want to see at the end, you stay and see the video or, you know, I, I'm giving this to you. You can post it and you can find it. No, it's, it's actually on our website. So if you go Already? To, yeah. Already. Already. Okay. Already okay. So now, I have not yet talked about what I came to talk about. <laughs> uh, I mean, in terms of the main storyline. So let me get to that. Uh, all right, all right, I do have to say. So Ron Rivera um, did devote his life to trying to set up a number of factories. He actually was responsible for 30 factories and died in Nigeria of malaria, setting up his 30th factory. And so that was a big tragedy. Um, but others have carried on the work of setting up factories. Um, our little piece of the story is that um, my students and I were the first to do independent studies of these ceramic pot filters. Mazzari Egos had done his own studies back in the 1980s, but we had kind of an independent set of people coming and looking at these um, filters, and um, we were there at the first um, successfully built factory. Um, which came about after Hurricane Mitch, a big devastating hurricane in Central America in 1998. And um, this is the latest and greatest list of how many factories there are in the world. This is hot off the press from um, colleagues of mine and I. Um, there are now, over the past decade, um, we've gone from one to 52 factories in 32 countries. So that's kind of um, good news. Um, and if you're interested in what countries, this is the list. Um, you'll have this PowerPoint presentation. So at our own factory, uh, we've worked on different shapes. The quality of the water doesn't have anything to do with the shape, but the flow rate does. And um, we've gone from the conventional shape, which is the Pizarro shape, the Potter's Repeat shape. It's a flower pot shape, the one in the middle here, to um, a cone shaped uh, on the left there, to a hemisphere filter shape. And we've uh, built uh, or brought the, the, the press on the left is one I brought in my suitcase in 2010. And Manny um, has helped us build the paraboloid and the hemisphere filter press. So this is what our filters, um, we've standardized on the hemisphere shaped filters for a number of reasons. And we chose uh, the pot concept itself because actually nothing else was working in northern Ghana. Um, that's a whole other story, but just. Um, um, the challenge of such highly turbid water, uh, like these are typical samples of the water, and um, the, um, it was one reason that we chose the pot, because it was working in those highly challenging conditions. And we also chose the ceramic pot filter because there's an um, ancient tradition of ceramic uh, pot um, household water management. And this is my hand in a randomly walked into house um, in a village that we were driving through when I said, stop the truck, do they have filters in this village? I want to just walk in and see how this filter is doing. And um, nice to see you. Yeah, you're back from Kenya. Good. Um, um, also, it works. All right? And so, since 2010, we've been working on building our factory, and we've now completed um, some of the structure. And um, these are just shots. We also just got hooked up to the electric grid, which is a hugely big deal. We were actually given a bill, or an estimate, that before um, about $50,000 to get connected to the grid a couple of years ago. So it was looking like we wouldn't have grid electricity for a very long time. Um, but uh, lo and behold, things changed, and we do. Uh, the characteristics of this pot filter, um, based on our January research, is um, that we're getting about five liters per hour. We're getting about two log removal of bacteria and about 92% turbidity reduction. And we're using a combination of two clays and rice husk. I've got 10 minutes left, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I was intending and gave as my title was Lessons Learned. <laughs> and I haven't gotten to that. And in fact, as I put this together in the last two days, I realized, well, you'll see, I've got a few successes. We, we have a few successes um, represented by the sales of the filters that we have been able to manage, um, both uh, direct sales to customers like the blue bars here, as well as emergency sales like to UNICEF or Oxfam or for guinea worm. 
outbreak. Um, and then we got into this. And, and by the way, these first five years were sales of filters that we sourced from the south of Ghana, from Accra, the capital, um, at a factory that where Ron Rivera trained the people to make these filters. All right, and we were always, in those early years, happy to be distributors and trainers and monitors and researchers of those filters. We didn't think we wanted to get into the filter making business, but um, actually during um, these distributions we had huge numbers of quality control issues with um, the filters from that factory. In fact, for 2,000 of these filters in one shipment, 1,700 were defective. And um, so we uh, took the decision after that. Could you visually see that? Or no, we had to test all of them. We had to retest all of them. Um, and, um, and then we asked if we could go into a joint venture with um, this. We like Peter, um, the, the factory uh, owner. Um, but anyway, long story short, he's in the south. We're in the north. We're, t we're, t we're 12 hours distance. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been a wild ride to build our own factory as represented by the video that you haven't seen. Um, another success besides the sales that we have, which represents in these five years reaching about 100,000 people, is, um, which is maybe a small number or maybe a big number, but it's, it's all we've been able to manage in five years. Um, it's certainly not safe water for a billion people, um, but it's, uh, it's a little foothold in, in um, an important part of the world for where safe water and sanitation is needed. We've also played a role in helping to eradicate guinea worm in Ghana. Um, this, is, um, this is one of the districts where that guinea worm outbreak took place. This woman has a worm coming out of her foot, and her village and um, other households like hers were given our filters, um, and the guinea worm eradication campaign would readily say that we helped um, in the last stages of the eradication of guinea worm in Ghana. Um, our fact, uh, so the, those are our successes. We've sold some filters, we've helped eradicate guinea worm, and uh, our factory is operational. <laughs> All right? And, uh, oh, and then I put in a few other successes, which is that it's been exceedingly hard to um, involve um, women, especially in the management of our enterprise, um, local Ghanaian women, that is. Uh, but we do have women who are both our filter makers from Belai, the clay village down the road, and from Taha, our immediate neighbor village, um, who are, these women do the clay processing. And we have a great staff of mostly men, um, like for example, Abraham and Ahasan. It's really hard work, uh, fire work. It's like 100 degrees all the time in northern Ghana. And um, then you put fire on top of that. It's really, and 12 hours of it, you know, and so it's a tough job. We've also done well uh, with our management. Um, Mary Kay is an American engineer, water engineer who with her family moved to Ghana six years ago, and they are probably there for the duration. Um, so she's been, um, she signs our checks and manages our bank account and keeps the whole act together. John is our factory manager. So our challenges uh, I could do a whole talk on, but funding is one, quality control. You know, we've criticized Peter Tomiko from the South for the lack of quality of his filters, and now we're, we've uh, got quality problems of our own. We have lots of bad roads in Ghana, and um, transporting the filters has been a challenge. Um, yeah, uh, I think also um, there's been a lot of inflation um, in Ghana um, lately, and so fuel costs and transportation costs are really, really high. Um, we've pretty much managed to handle the breakage in, in transport. We've got that kind of figured out, but breakage in households is still a big issue. So we're working on that. Our design of the hemisphere shape is one that we think is a stronger design. Um, long stories there. We have a dissemination and scale up challenges. There's challenges around generating demand. I love this picture. <laughs> You've got the woman carrying the water in the, in the background <laughs> here while the, the chiefs are sort of sitting around with their feet up. Um, and, um, We've got challenges in um, proper maintenance and cleaning, um, behavior change. We have um, just been, with Mark, uh, revising our training manual for the distribution, the UNICEF distribution that we're about to engage in. 
and so Marcus, one, one of his you know, 62,000 things on his plate was to get Ghanaian images of correct use, <laughs> consistent use, and continuous use. <laughs> so next time you see this slide, it will have, it will have Ghanaian images. <laughs> and then um, this is a typical retailer. Like you saw those bar blue bars of like our direct sales. This is like our direct sales agent right here, okay? The Peace and Love Beauty Salon probably sells two filters a year. <laughs> so um, that's the kind, that, that, that's downtown Tomalay, all right? Um, you maybe have all heard of or gone to lectures of Michael Kramer, who's the Gates Professor of Economics here at Harvard, and um, he's part of a group called the Poverty Action Lab. Um, at MIT and a spinoff called Innovations for Poverty Action. And I was able to um, corral some poverty action people, um, recent PhD um, uh, grad, uh, young, young professors basically who have um, done a study of our filter. It, it's, it's longer than I have. So let me just say that we have um, some, some pretty sophisticated understanding of what people are willing to pay and the long and the short of it is that 92% of people are willing to pay $1.33 for something that costs us about $20 to produce. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's that's definitely a challenge. All right. Um, um, so let me just say, I mean, you know, folks are free to leave if you want, but I feel like yeah. this is really just very interesting, and I wouldn't. I mean, I would personally would would like to stay a little bit longer, and, and if you have time, I do, of course, to. No. Um, the two things that I'm very interested in hearing about is this question of mm -hmm. willingness to pay and pricing, because it is such an issue in the development community around how much you price things for, what do you do, and then the other thing is the design question about how you actually came to the spherical shape, mm -hmm. because it sounds like there's some interesting there are. observations there, there are. that there might are. There are. And apply. I, but if folks need to leave, you're welcome to do so, but I think this is what we really well, but as you can see, I can talk till the cows come home on this subject. So, but in case people do need to leave and haven't had a chance to ask questions yet, let's do that first, and then I'll I'll, I'll go into those two points. Okay. Um, so, are there any? You may address this. But I'd be particularly interested to know your thought about if you had a choice to for families there to get a filter for free mm -hmm. versus requiring to. Right. You, but you, what would you? Decide? This is exactly what I think about. Twenty-four okay, so seven, right now. It, no, no. Then, yeah. So I, let me give it to you in a nutshell. Then, uh -huh. all right. Um, you saw our two goals: to reach the people most in need of safe water and to become financially and locally self-sustaining. All right. And and there's a kind of contradiction there, right? You also saw the slide where I showed that there there's been growth from one factory to whatever I said, 58 factories in 30 whatever countries. Um, but of those, a lot of those are just pretty small workshops. Um, and yet there are a few factories that have been quite successful. All right, And those are, the, those are of great interest to me, and I've had the opportunity to visit several of them, and I've had students working in several of them. One of them is in Guatemala, and um, it was uh, started by, not by Fernando Mazariegos, but by a Guatemalan MBA from Wharton School of Business, who is a native son, who um, has business smarts, and who has created, uh, has just recently built his second factory, and it's a multi-million dollar factory, and he can't make filters fast enough. He sells to the urban market in Guatemala City, where People have piped water, but they don't trust it, and so they buy bottled water. And he's created a marketing campaign around if you filter your water for three months, if, you, if you're buying bottled, bottled water uh, on a regular basis to feed your family, then in three months you can transition for the cost of a filter. Mm -hmm. And he's selling his filters. His low-end filter is like $40, and his high-end is $250. And his most popular models are like 70 or $80. Now, uh, the GDP per capita in, in Guatemala is, is uh, like three times that. Uh, Guatemala is not a rich country, but it's still much richer than Ghana. And we're in the poorest part of Ghana. So we, we, we don't have an easy 
solution to becoming financially and locally self-sustaining um, because of our choice to reach the people most in need rather than to be placing ourselves in the urban area and selling, as he does, most of his filters to a middle class who already has improved water, all right? Is that what this data showed, that the study that you... This data? Yeah. No, this data is of villagers. Okay, this data is of our filter in right. villages um, doing their these, um, um, take it or leave it game and a, and a um, Becker, DeGroote, Marshak um, mechanism game um, that they, they these economists feel, I'm sorry if I'm not representing it well, but that they get very accurate information on willingness to pay from these games, right? And so this is the results of the take it or leave it game, and, um, and these are the results of the um, Becker, DeGroote, a Marshak game, and, and it's even lower, okay? So this gives you actual numbers, like a dollar, uh, 33 is 92 percent, and like 20 percent are willing to pay four dollars. All right, of these village poor villagers. All right, and um, so go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just go. wondering. It seems like in, in that situation we have um, the water is free. The water there's, is free. There's no service entity or authority that, like in Guatemala, where they can get back. I mean, there's some comparison to what they would pay for service. So, who manages the supply of water? Is it just so in a rural area, it's there's there's two entities within the government. One is is called the Ghana Water Company, and they're the urban water people. So you know our equivalent for us would be like the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority for, for Greater Boston, and then they have the Community Water and Sanitation Agency, the CWSA, and they're the authority responsible for community water, for rural water, and so. Improved water in the communities is by and large borehole drilled water or what's called an improved dug well. A dug well is a hole in the ground, but an improved dug well has um, an apron and a cover and a hand pump. And um, so those would be, and, and some rainwater harvesting, although it's, it's it, 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 anyway, some uh, small degree of rainwater harvesting, but as I said, there's only three months of rain, so you run out of that, so you, then you default to your dugout, or you walk the extra mile to the to the borehole, which may or may not be functional. Okay, so there are authorities to, to work on that, but by and large, the funding for um, water and sanitation is coming from the international donor community. It's not coming from the government, and that is kind of a typical situation in lots of developing countries. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. What's the distance that people have to walk to get the water? Um, it, it varies by season, um, and um, and it also varies just by by village and what their natural endowment is. So some of the dugouts, like the one in Taha, it, it maintains water year-round, but other villages, it'll dry up and you have to walk to the next village. There is a culture of sharing so that um, if, if your dugout dries up, the people in the next village will share their water from their dugout if they have a you know, perpetually supplied water. water. Um, because of that, and I don't know if I can say this, Clement, what do you think? Um, do you think that, I mean, we're much more of a private ownership, individual responsibility culture, and Ghanaian culture is much more of a shared culture. But do you think that that in any way affects people's lack of willingness to pay for water because they think it should be free or they think it should be shared? To a greater extent, this, uh, I think that's, that's the reason because uh, in general, mostly people are blaming com uh, communal ownership of, of property. Um, whatever is in the community is uh, communally owned. Um, even the structures you see there, uh, they, don't really, they don't really pay for masons to build their houses. They, um, when you want to build your house, you ask for communal labor, people can help you to build your house. When the, the neighbors you need to build this house, you go over there and help them build this house. And the same thing they do with farming too. When you cultivate your crops, you need to weed it, you ask for communal labor. And they really, that's what it is. So I think uh, it's very difficult to ask people to pay for things when they are used to communally helping themselves to carry out activities. So I was at, um, so these, um, these 
hotshot economists um, had a conference uh, two weeks ago in London at the London School of Economics, and um, they uh, were presenting um, the various recent work on um, um, willingness to pay for health products like um, uh, deworming medicines and bed nets and um, water treatment devices or water treatment, um, we treated water. And um, I uh, got invited to be a respondent to this paper. And um, it seems as though some of the interesting recent papers uh, in this topic area are finding that um, both with deworming medicines, with bed nets, and now with um, water, uh, treated water, that um, paying nothing um, does not um, limit use. In other words, if people are given it for free, they might use it just as much or even possibly more than people who haven't have, have been expected to pay. There has been this idea that if you pay for it, you value it more, but we're, we're not necessarily finding that to be the case. Um, and that leads to this whole challenge that is right at the forefront of my life and of my NGO's the future. Um, which is um, whether we proceed with um, direct sales or free distribution. And we have an interesting contradiction because having, been, having had this sort of hiatus uh, over the last couple of years where we've been, we're a small organization with little funding and you know, so it was all we could do to build our factory. And we weren't selling in that time because we weren't producing and we weren't happy with Peter Tomiko's filters. So now we're, we're just started to produce and we have our first order, so we're, I, the image I have is like, you know, you see those fledgling little creatures like um, calves or antelopes when they come out of the womb and they're just trying to stand up, you know, <laughs> so they little shaky feet, you know, and we're on our little shaky feet trying to, we've got the orders and we've got the production and we're trying to sort of like stand up and sort of see if we can survive. And we've got two orders right now. We've got a UNICEF order for a thousand filters which is coming from remnant money from the Guinea worm campaign. In other words, Guinea worm was successfully eradicated in 2011, and um, there, it was helped significantly by a big multi-million dollar grant from the European Union. And there was a little bit of money left over, and when we did that 4,000 filter distribution, not all filter, uh, communities in the area got free filters. Um, but it was, it was okay, they eradicated guinea worm, but still there's lots of people without safe water. So it happens that a thousand of those filters have been paid for and we're about to do, Mark is about to help oversee that distribution, mm -hmm. all right? That's a free distribution, and it's all in the same general neighborhood. I mean, in the same district, let me put it that way. Go ahead. Okay. I think um, this is one of the reasons why people really don't want to pay, because uh, they always expect the government to come in, mm -hmm. uh, NGOs to bring in. I mean, um, basically to them free. They are used to getting things free for NGOs. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So and so we've all read Dead Aid, yeah. and so we are impressed by that, you yeah. know. And so, and, and that has been, that's, for, for seven years, we've been kind of operating on a sort of social entrepreneurship model. And we've struggled to sell, and we've done some sales, you know. But meanwhile, we're getting the NGO contracts that are giving them away for free. And meanwhile, the contract that we concurrently have for a rotary distribution for 1,250 filters um, contractually obl obligated Pure Home Water to sell them for five CDs, all right? Now, interestingly, um, this data um, in other villages, but again, in the same district, um, oh, wait, 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 shows, um, here we go. <laughs> um, this line uh, from the same guys, Barry Fisher and Gutierrez, found that willingness to pay 3.5 3 CDs, which is about $2, um, is the most successful in terms of uh, diarrheal disease reduction. It's getting about 25% diarrheal di disease reduction. So if you believe their work, and this represents sort of like two years and $200,000 study of 17 villages and hundreds of households, you would say, charge them 350, and you know, and hopefully you get 25% diarrheal disease reduction, right? Um, but what we contracted 
before with the rotary was five CD, which is getting like less than zero percent disease <laughs> reduction. <laughs> For you know, I, I take all of this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, I don't. I'm not. I'm impressed with their work, and I I don't believe it all. Okay, and um, so but anyway, that's what we're confronted with is that we have. You know, we're, we're, we're selling in some communities, we're giving out free in other communities, and we're shooting ourselves in the foot as a social enterprise, right? Um, to sell at full cost. Um, in, in, northern, in the northern region is probably not going to fly, all right? Mm. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, is there a way to do, um, the, to use the filter in a, in a, from a central water source so that everyone doesn't need to have one at their home? Mm. Um, so I think you missed me talking about community water solutions. Yeah. yeah, and so that is an example of a fabulous community-based solution. Um, and I can talk to you. I, I mean, you heard Kate, maybe. Did she come to the class last year? I don't know. Uh, I think she didn't come, and I just talked about Kate oh, okay. last year myself. Um, and can you go back to the design question? About yeah. Yeah, um, so I, on uh, the Safe Water for a Billion People is our, the URL for my website, and that shows um, 14 years of, of master's thesis work. Uh, and among those theses, uh, we have some very technical work on uh, flow patterns um, and in the different filter designs. And um, the situation in Africa and Ghana is um, big family sizes and one of the drawbacks, okay, so I never intended to become an advocate for any one system or even household systems, even though I've come to be associated with household systems, but rather small scale solutions, all right? I've sort of stumbled in first to household systems because it was workable professionally and, um, and um, I've stumbled into ceramic pots because I'm in northern Ghana and they were working when chlorination wasn't working and cellular disinfection wasn't working and a lot of other types of, um, of processes weren't working because of the high turbidity. I, I don't know if I mentioned, but I've been maybe working as engineering projects in 25 countries and this is the highest turbidity I've ever seen. Um, and, um, and turbidity is a challenge to water treatment. Um, because you can't disinfect a water if it's got a huge number of particles in it. And um, to give an example, I was giving a lunch talk to um, CH2M Hill engineers. They design water treatment plants in the United States, a bunch of older white men. And I asked them in their careers what was the highest turbidity they'd ever seen. And they looked around the room at each other and talked among themselves, and they said 100, right? And that turbidity that I showed you um, in that picture above, um, of those random samples that we've collected, uh, wherever they are, um, is, um, is upwards of 2,000, all right? Um, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. There it is, there it is. Um, so this, 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 this tube is showing um, a turbidity, uh, maybe, maybe it's 1,500, but it's a big number, okay? And, um, and the digital turbidometer uh, unit that you use to measure it can't even do that number. All right, it's so high. And this is, and you can see that this is like every sample from each of these different ones is like up there. The average for, for a whole bunch of these that we um, computed was uh, 650. So the highest ever seen by these boss, these U.S. engineers was 100. All right, so that makes water very hard to treat, and that's. And, and that doesn't mean that the ceramic filter is, 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 is right for everywhere or is a silver bullet. No, 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 no. And it's not even perfect where we are. And it can't, you, it, you can't make a ceramic filter this big. You know, I mean, you can't make a community scale of it because you'd have to have a kiln, you know, to have one pot or whatever you do. You could have, um, you could have cartridges, and there are ceramic cartridges that would go into uh, what are called point of entry systems, like you know where the pipe comes into the household or the you know commercial establishment. Um, um, yeah, so 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 these these are other possibilities. Um, 
Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is the space that I work in, all right, and the dilemmas that I'm confronted. Um, let me just end on um, some note. I think I was, gave many examples of challenges, um, and what I ended with successes, challenges are many, and the um, lessons are few. Uh, <laughs> lessons are basically persevere, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> under adversity. And, um, but, but um, really, it's quite an exciting time for Pure Home Water right now. Um, uh, Mark is there, uh, a fellow from your program. Uh, he's there for three months. Uh, and its timing is ideal because both the managing director and I cannot be there during the time of these uh, first big contracts that we have. Um, and so Mark is helping with that. Meanwhile, Manny, the guy who's helped us build the factory, has just arrived for his seventh trip. And we're about to build our biggest kiln yet uh, for 100 filters. And uh, that will be built in the next month. We also have gotten a $100,000 donation, which is amazing. Well, about two years of work to build what you saw it represents about $100,000. So to kind of double that is big for our little NGO. And, um, and uh, we, will be, um, in, we will be sourcing and building um, some, now that we have power, some mechanical equipment, which should improve the quality of our filters. So those are exciting developments. We've got this, we've got um, hand washing stations and a contract to do um, over 1,000 of those. Um, we have a new team of M MIT students that will be going there um, to do various interesting pro projects. And my current baby um, that I am interested in um, finding an income stream for is what I call a wash package of goods that would include a filter, um, a hand washing station, and um, a sanitation. Um, and one Adam from our class um, last uh, spring um, is um, done some interesting work, as have um, some prior students on sanitation in northern Ghana. And what I like, it, let's see, this is our ecological sanitation latrine. This is a, my, my colleague Mary Kay, our managing director, has built some other types of latrines. And somewhere in this, oh yeah, Arbor Lou is this. So. Um, Arborlu has been a very successful, um, simple technology in Ethiopia, um, in um, Muslim communities. Not only exclusively Muslim, but one of the issues that we're dealing with in northern Ghana is um, that um, the Muslims um, religiously uh, don't want to handle waste. So ecological sanitation is perhaps not the best solution for them. And um, this solution is really cheap. Um, and um, to me, is sort of like a first step on the sanitation ladder that um, would be an appropriate first step for like all of rural northern Ghana. Um, also, kind of can tell us that northern that throughout Ghana there's a big pro problem with deforestation, and so um, having a shallow hall, which by the way in my package costs, um, I have it as fifty dollars, but it's really like thirty three. But I've just uh, padded this because we would need money to implement it. Um, so the technology itself would be about $35 maybe. Is there any hope for a university in Ghana to work with you? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, th there is hope. Um, there's, um, there's the, in our neighborhood, there's something called the University of Development Studies. I've been very impressed with this university and its students. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we, we struggle with being sort of small and running around, <laughs> not having enough time to do all that we had to, what tried to do. I tried to uh, set up a, a collaborative project with MIT and the chancellor of the university about five years ago, and MIT kind of shot it down at the time. Um, so that was disappointing. Um, and there are some excellent universities in the south of Ghana, um, and we've had some uh, students, uh, like, like um, Peter went to the University of and um, we've had staff from the technical university. Great. Well, with that, um, any more questions? Please join me in thanking Susan for a very interesting talk.